So thanks everyone for joining us. And I'm also looking ahead to having this posted. Uh, I know of some other people who are looking forward to seeing it. And so we've got a, a nice audience today and a potentially expanding audience. And it's really a pleasure to be joining you uh, as part of the Urban Ecology Center's backyard in my, or UEC in my backyard series with uh, research and community science. I've been so fortunate to be affiliated and work with this group for a number of years now, especially uh, in my role as a biology professor at El Verno College. And a couple of my former students are with us today. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. I'm, I'm really impressed and proud with the things they are doing now. And some of it uh, you will see relates back to the work I've been doing over a number of years. And I'm also a little bit, um, I'm a little anxious about this audience because some of you are really experts and really already know uh, kind of where this whole thing is heading to talk about uh, who in who in your backyard is the is the expert is the naturalist and for for many of you you would already know to just hold up a mirror and say yeah that's me I, I know what's going on here um, but I'm I'm thinking of a wider audience too with the project that I've been uh, working on for a number of years now is really bringing this message to classrooms to especially college students and also to adult learners in a lot of different settings. So I hope uh, the things that are maybe obvious to some of you already, you'll bear with me. And I also hope that you'll kind of add your expertise and insights along the way. So let me jump into this um, to talk just a little bit about the idea of a naturalist tradition, that this isn't something uh, we've just stumbled upon. The idea of citizen science or community science is not a brand new idea under the sun. It's actually part of a long, long tradition of work that is done. So I've got some uh, questions that I've put together uh, to kind of lead us into this topic. And they start out with maybe the most obvious and immediate one, what is a naturalist? And I think this is an important one to consider because of the ways that we sometimes uh, try to define things and we define certain people in and certain people out of certain roles. And so this is something I'd like to expand a little bit. Uh, I wanna think a little bit about the origins of the naturalist tradition. Uh, where does it come from and, and how do we point to its beginnings, um, and how do we know, or do we know that this tradition is ongoing? What are some of the, the markers that tell us that this is not a thing of the past or something that has faded into history or obscurity? Uh, I'm building a lot of this around the work of historian of biology, Paul Farber, who has got an excellent and, and really a kind of a, a fine little book if you're interested, I have the book in my hand and you can see it's pretty thin. Uh, and some of my students will attest that it's quite readable and something that you can uh, get through in a fairly short amount of time as an overview. So this is a, a helpful way of thinking about that tradition. And then I also wanna open up the question a little bit to you all about what assumptions you make what it means to be a naturalist. Kind of going back to that first question. Uh, so we'll have some, some uh, points of discussion along the way and maybe some discussion at the end if you have time. Um, what are the common assumptions we make about what it is to be a naturalist and why it matters? Why does it matter that we think of naturalists as being certain people with a certain background or a certain kind of expertise or maybe even a particular kind of training uh, along the way? So those are the, the questions, kind of the challenges for, for me to try to get into today. So I'm gonna throw here a, a list of names. And this is a kind of a quick list, kind of an off the top of my head list, thinking about who I think might count as a naturalist. And some of these names I think are probably pretty familiar to you uh, and others of them might be less familiar to you. And if you see your own name on this list, then I think I have really done a good job of capturing some of the important naturalists in my life. So let me uh, stop sharing the screen for a minute here. And if you had a chance to look at that list, um, tell me a little bit if you wanna uh, 
tune back in. Uh, tell me which names you recognize, what names you maybe were surprised to hear. If you want to put your hand up, I'll, I'll call on people to be a little bit more systematic. Anyone see some names on there that you wanted to comment on? Okay, wait a minute. Yes. I saw Ethan and Tim and Maggie. Yes, you did. Those are important naturalists in my life and probably in a lot of your lives as well. And Jen Callahan. Oh, and Jen. And Jen Callahan, absolutely. So there were locals and then there were also historical founders like your and um, oh, what was the name? Leopold. Yeah, you think think of them as founders and as part of the history, right? Right. Certainly, uh, the U.S. Naturalists. I didn't really see too many non-American. Right. Good. So we tend to think, at least we all tend to think, we think of the naturalist tradition as being recent and mostly American. Good. Well, not that I will recognize, but are any of the names of native people from America? Okay, that's a good observation, is maybe by their absence, you might notice there are not uh, indigenous people on this list for the most part. There aren't names that we would recognize as uh, American Indian tradition uh, of their knowledge. Good point. So do you need to ask the indigenous tribes who their native, you know, uh, leaders have been in, in their feelings about the natural world here in America? Right, so, I, and I think the way you're asking that is especially important, is how do we include names and voices and uh, aspects of this tradition that aren't already there? How do we go back and recapture that? How do we include more of those voices and those traditions? Are there also voices that aren't individuals, but organizations? Right. So this tradition is a lot of times based on kind of these founders and these uh, recognizable individuals. But there are within the tradition also, like you say, organizations or schools or institutions that have made their contributions. Good. Yeah, certainly in Europe, you had um, scientific organizations that would sponsor what we would consider naturalists. And without their sponsorship, it might have been more difficult for the naturalists to reach a larger audience. Right, absolutely. Just a shout out to uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is on the list, who is indigenous and writes about uh, indigenous ways of thinking about being a naturalist. Absolutely. Nancy, you caught that one and I was going to be sure to circle back to it. So you're, you're making my job easier by recognizing these things already. Thank you. Okay, so let's go back and just look at this list again together for a minute. And I'll actually jump ahead a slide um, from, from this list now to a list that I've kind of uh, simplified. And if you wanna go ahead and mute your uh, microphones again, thank you. Um, so what I did is I kind of highlighted the ones that I think are probably most familiar to many of you, at least if you've been in a tradition of uh, the American education system where we uh, have scientists who show up in textbooks and who get a lot of uh, credit and acclaim. Uh, and when I, when I kind of simplified the list in that way, I ended up with just Rachel Carson is the only woman uh, who shows up regularly in this kind of history. And people like Leopold and John Muir, uh, especially recently, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, have started to come under a new kind of scrutiny for some of their, um, their writings and their beliefs, their personal beliefs that also colored their science, uh, that included attitudes toward 
non-white people and towards uh, even kind of eugenic principles in their writing. Uh, and if you've read them and you've read them carefully, you know that those things have been there all along. It's not new, uh, but it's, it's come under new scrutiny because this is a time when we're trying to understand uh, how we got to some of the systemic uh, ideas we have across society and the environmental movement and the naturalist tradition is not immune from those. Uh, but as Nancy pointed out, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer is uh, a naturalist, a botanist, uh, uh, specializing in mosses who has written beautifully and wonderfully about the natural world and includes in a kind of, I mean, to me, it's just a, a breathtaking way, an understanding of the naturalist tradition that includes her, her own native background um, as an American Indian and is really instructive in helping any of us to think more about how different traditions have uh, fed into this. So really an important one. Uh, and, and when the list looks like this, you see there are actually a lot of women involved. Uh, and it's not just those, you know, those few kind of heroic individuals, but it's a, it's a much wider range of people. And, and that's a point I want to emphasize. But it's tough to make that emphasis with the way the naturalist tradition is often taught. So just to give you a quick overview, and I'll try not to take too much time on this, but if you'll indulge me, I really love teaching at Alverno a course that's called The Natural History of North America. And I will try not to point out every person in these pictures who has uh, shaped and influenced the work that I'm doing, uh, but I, I can't help uh, point out there's Nancy right there who has been very helpful over the years in giving a broad perspective to our work, to the students' understanding of what it means to be a naturalist, to be a professional in this field, and to share expertise at all levels within the community um, as, a, as a real uh, kind of path-breaking uh, landscape architect and naturalist. I take students out in the snow and in the rain, and I take them to museums and exhibits, uh, and I take them to parks around the city of Milwaukee to talk about North America, because I think that uh, understanding this whole tradition of natural history has to be done outside the classroom for the most part, and has to go beyond the books that they're reading. So uh, as much as they sometimes uh, suffer with cold toes and cold fingers, um, they get a, a better sense of what it means to be a naturalist and to be a part of this. And this is actually something that in the, um, the study of biology nationwide, more and more uh, educators have been calling for this kind of interaction in the environment. Uh, and so, it's important at Alverno and in the teaching that I do to provide this opportunity. In our curriculum, we have this course and we have an ecology course that include regular field outings. And other than that, as with most biology curricula, uh, students spend most of their time in classrooms and laboratories. And most of what they study is at the level of the cell or below, uh, all the way down to molecular biology. So natural history um, includes those things, but actually giving students a broader perspective is, is really important. Uh, I love the quote from this article that appeared in Science Magazine a couple of years ago, um, that students need to stand knee deep in nature. Um, and so the idea that we can have digital simulations and that we can uh, do a lot of instruction about the natural world with those kinds of uh, virtual experiences is a possibility and it's certainly important. It's increasingly important right now as we're not able to, to gather even in classrooms or labs, but it's not sufficient. And so um, instructors, professors and teachers need to do uh, as much as they can to embrace the naturalist tradition and get people, well, there they are, knee deep in nature. Uh, and also in this picture, you might recognize Kim Forbeck here from the UEC's um, land stewardship department. And 
again, here's, I think this is Nancy's writing on the board uh, with some instructions she was giving along the way. Um, I think it's important in these outings that students really uh, kind of connect to the natural world and they get hooked into it maybe in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. I find this is so important for many of my students. Um, not all of them are naturals like Elizabeth or, or Leela where they love to be out in nature. They're constantly drawn to it. Um, some students, even biology majors, are uncomfortable initially. They haven't spent time outside. Uh, I walked with a group of students down into the Menominee Valley a couple of years ago and as we were coming back up to the street, to the Urban Ecology Center, one of them said, well, that was really cool, but I was so scared going down there. I thought we were going into the wilderness. And she was just, I mean, you could see what, what a shift she'd had in her mind just over the course of an hour and a half or two hours, uh, thinking she was going into some really uh, obscure place, some almost frightening place, and had this wonderful experience and then was eager to go back. I do uh, really make a point to emphasize that the place that we are visiting uh, from week to week is a place that they have access to. And a lot of students in Milwaukee are uh, a little bit uncomfortable with this idea initially. Uh, they feel like there are certain places in the city where they belong and there are other places where they're, they're not really expected to go. And so that has a kind of social justice component to it that, that goes along with this. Um, so when we talk about diversity in the city, and then we talk about biodiversity, uh, it turns out that the students don't always uh, have personal experiences that allow them to think comfortably about what it means to be uh, in different places and participate in, in these ways, even as biologists. So a couple of important points there. Um, I also like to show students that we are all together in this process developing partnerships across the city. So students will meet with, uh, there's uh, a DNR naturalist there. there, they meet with naturalists from Milwaukee County Parks, uh, of course they meet many naturalists from the Urban Ecology Center, and they get to even learn a little bit from me and see how the partnerships I've developed with the Milwaukee Public Museum uh, and with uh, individuals like Nancy Ayton and Dan Collins and how that provides them opportunities beyond the classroom and really beyond, um, beyond what they might have expected from the classroom. Those are important pieces of the naturalist tradition, the idea of having partnerships, having institutions that work together that share information uh, and offer each other different kinds of expertise. Um, and as I'm mentioning expertise, uh, this is also a real boon for me because uh, although I teach in a biology department, although I have an undergraduate degree in biology, uh, my PhD is actually in the history of science and technology. And uh, I don't consider myself to be uh, a very, proficient naturalist in a lot of areas. Like uh, if we're gonna go out and do some bird watching and, and birding, uh, if we're gonna do identification of insects, if we're gonna be out in the prairie and, and lay out some quadrats, I need experts. So here in, in this picture, uh, we've got some students holding a, oops, holding a monarch butterfly. Uh, I didn't mean to do that, got into the wrong. Uh, maybe you're still seeing what you need to see, but I just, hit the wrong button and now I can see it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so here's Jen Callahan holding a monarch butterfly. This is from a few years back. We miss Jen, but she's still around in a lot of the, the programming in different ways. Um, and then just gotta get back control of my screen. There we go. Uh, and then exploring the community beyond the classroom, as I've kind of emphasized along the way. Uh, and students get to find their way through uh, Milwaukee and Milwaukee County in new ways and in their own ways, which is really kind of fun. Uh, this, this picture of students coming up in the Menominee Valley through that, that section um, and the, the Stormwater Park uh, was just a, a great memory. They, they were all uh, in the rain, getting wet, climbing, 
uh, along this trail and just laughing. I, I mean, I wasn't down in there at the moment. They all started laughing. I have no idea really what provoked it, but they were just having such a good time uh, and had been experiencing the valley in a new way. So very important piece as well. Uh, and there's even me in this picture um, out there with them. This is a group with Nancy and Dan Collins was with us and we had just seen the, the river shift directions before our very eyes um, as it had been flowing downstream toward the lake and then flowing back upstream during one of the, the Seiche events. Um, so they, they get to see this kind of uh, activity as well and really uh, a good way of uh, learning about the environment and recognizing that in in many cases what they learned in uh, grade school and middle school with some hands-on activities and then for most of them got away from in high school because everything went to the classroom and uh, with more emphasis on STEM in recent years a lot of students have had more uh, introduction to kind of engineering models and um, mathematics without the integration of natural history. So another important thing that, that I wanna bring back to the curriculum. Um, and on occasion, and there's, there's Elizabeth in this picture there. I didn't include that on, pur on purpose, but here she is and there she is a few years back uh, when we were out in Jackson Park near Alverno and even spotted a, a possum in the tree. Uh, and we also stood along the river in Menominee Valley and saw the sturgeon running, or the salmon running, sorry, um, on another day. So, so knowing that those things are happening nearby them uh, is, is exciting. And so that's all to show my students what I think is quite obvious now and, and maybe is obvious to most of you is that the naturalist tradition is ongoing. Uh, so this is a picture of, of me with my daughter, uh, one of my best friends from high school out in Puget Sound with his son um, and making sure that we're passing along what we learned from our mentors and our teachers uh, onto the next generation, something that we all see as important. So let me shift gears just a little bit uh, and ask you, uh, one of the names that was on the list and a name that I even said was a uh, memorable one, an important one in this history is Henry Coles. It's pronounced Coles, you might look at it with the W, but um, Henry Coles. And I wonder if any of you have heard of him and if so, maybe what you've heard. And I'm sure there are a couple of immediate uh, answers. Oh, there's Kalia, hey, cool. Um, that you might recognize that name or might know just a little bit about him. Anyone wanna raise a hand or, or chime in? Uh, what do you know about Henry Coles? We did have a question about someone asking about the, the, the changing river direction and, and how that actually works. Oh yeah, good, good. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, Nancy has posted a, a Wikipedia answer. Uh, so that's, that's pretty helpful. And Nancy, do you wanna chime in with a, a brief description of the stage? Since I learned it from you, you might as well share it with them. Um, sure. It's, well, the, the Wikipedia, um, entry is is pretty good, but it's basically I think of uh, Lake Michigan as uh, sort of like a bathtub full of water, and the wind pushes the water, makes waves that move from in the wind direction from west to east and reflect backwards, and these make standing waves that make the water from Lake Michigan come upstream the Menominee River, which is oriented straight east-west, so it's kind of perfectly in line with that uh, wave action. And the historical records document the Seiche as far upstream as about 30, 30th or 32nd Street, which is pretty much right where we were standing when we saw it that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've had just perfect timing in a number of cases where Nancy <laughs> and Dan have been out with us. And, and, and Dan is always real cagey about just 
you know, as a, as a naturalist, let's make some observations here. Which direction is the river flowing? And, you know, students are usually pretty good about saying, oh, yeah, there it's going. It's headed to the east. And does that make sense? Well, yeah, that's where the lake is. So that makes sense. Okay, good. So everybody's on the same page. And then 20 minutes later, he'll ask the same question and they'll look at the river and they're ready to answer. They think they know the, and, and then they watch and there's some ripples and some leaves that are moving toward the west that are headed upstream. And it's like, well, what is, is that just the wind? And then we have this whole uh you know in place description of the sage and it's much more uh real and then they'll all say how do you spell that and they're writing it down in their notebooks it's so wonderful i was going to mention about henry coles i i knew yeah. a little bit about him but uh one of the first things i found was looking up uh finding a cache of photographs in uh, I think in the Smithsonian Image Library that one of his students took from field trips in the 19 teens or 20s where all the students, mostly women students, are dressed in 1920s outfits um, out in the field in, in canoes, in wetlands, um, in wading in water, hugging the rocks of a bluff that they're inching along on, on field outings. So I, seeing photographs of him with the students was one of my first introductions. Great. Yeah, I'll show you a couple of photos that, that I've got here. Anyone else heard of Henry Coles in any context? No. No? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, let me, let me tell you a little bit more um, because I think as, as Nancy alluded, it's, there's some fascinating uh, things about him. He was a professor of botany at the University of Chicago um, back in the, the early 1900s. He is considered a pioneer of plant ecology. The, the science of ecology, you might know, uh, didn't really exist as such uh, before the middle of the 19th century. The, the term was actually coined in 1866 and didn't come into widespread use until uh, really the 1890s. And so to be a pioneer in ecology means you were doing important work uh, around that time, and, and Cole certainly was. Um, and it was really thinking about the connection between plants and other organisms and the relationships. Um, he is probably best known for uh, describing the concept of dune, dis dune succession. And if you've been to the, the sand dunes on the south shore of Lake Michigan, especially the Indiana sand dunes, now a national park, uh, you will see his name there. Uh, that's where he did some of his pioneering studies. Here's one of those pictures of Henry Coles, he's on the far uh, right side of the screen here uh, with a group of other naturalists, some his students and some probably uh, collaborators who would go out on these weekend outings. Uh, it looks very casual, comfortable. This is one of their lunch breaks, but there was typically a lot of hiking, a lot of stooping and looking down at the uh, at the plants as they were observing them, and a lot of note taking and describing the, the progress and the change in the, the dune systems. He would take his students to sites around the city of Chicago. Uh, I've looked at his notebooks and some of his curriculum, uh, and it's just fascinating to see that uh, like he's planning his his outings, he's planning his lessons, and there's a reference where if, if possible, he's gonna be uh, taking students that same afternoon, if the weather holds, he's gonna take them to this park or that park. Uh, and in some ways, doing exactly the kind of thing that uh, I was describing with my students. Uh, and I didn't know I was emulating him. Uh, in fact, I thought I was just doing what naturalists do. And of course, he's a naturalist. Uh, and so is one of, the, one of the models for that, which is pretty cool. Uh, here's another picture of one of those classes out around the city. Uh, you see them all nestled into this nice little forested hillside. There's Coles kind of uh, to the left side of this photo. You see all the, the wide-brimmed hats. Uh, a lot of his uh, students, uh, women who would come along on these outings, uh, along with groups of men. And then he also took students on excursions across the continent. Um, year after year, he would take them uh, west through the, the mountains and out to California and around the, uh, the parks in southern Utah uh, and northern Arizona. 
here's a, a class at uh, Cedar Breaks, which is in southern Utah. And if you look closely at this picture, I think you can, you can spot Coles. I think you'll know which one he is because this is a class appar apparently entirely of women. Uh, so again, I relate to that, teaching at Alverno, um, taking out these groups and having this experience of bringing women out into nature. Uh, and I think back in the 1920s when this picture was taken, this must have been a pretty extraordinary opportunity for women who at that time were not expected to even um, get college diplomas. Uh, most didn't even attend college, and if they did, they probably didn't travel across the country. Um, but in certain situations, they did, and Coles was one of the one of the professors who made that happen. So a really important uh, contributor to to this work. So uh, let's see. I think uh, I got this a little out of order. Let me just put all this up there. Uh, a couple more quick things about Coles is that he had a student named Victor Shelford who was a pioneer in animal ecology uh, and that's another name that might be familiar to some, some of you. Uh, if it is, I'm not too surprised. He is very influential, uh, had a lot of students of his own who were important in this history uh, and was himself an accomplished naturalist and field ecologist who took students out in the field. Uh, Henry Coles was also an instructor for a time and an inspiration to May Thielgard Watts, uh, a pioneering landscape architect, a woman who wrote uh, extensively about her experience both uh, with Coles in some of the, the work that she did and learning in his classes, uh, but also in her, her own landscape work. Um, Coles also collaborated with uh, Jens Jensen, who is a pioneering landscape architect and one of the one of the people who, uh, working across Wisconsin and Illinois and um, other parts of the country as well, uh, was very influential in some of the the parks that we enjoy and some of the natural areas that have been preserved. Uh, and both of those people. Uh, Watts and Jensen were influential to Nancy Aiton, who's with us, and Nancy has been influential to me. Uh, and so, you know, this, this tradition is continuing in some important ways. I can trace some of my practice and some of my knowledge and expertise directly back to Coles. Um, I can trace some of it directly back to Coles also through Victor Shelford, who had a student, uh, Erwin Rasmussen, who was the ecologist who studied the deer of the Kaibab Plateau north of the Grand Canyon. Uh, I wrote my dissertation about the history of that deer herd, so I was connected uh, in that way back to Shelford, back to Coles, and so on. And uh, just about any of you, if you've taken an ecology class, uh, you've probably also encountered Coles and Shelford uh, through studies of succession, through studies of uh, plant and animal ecology, uh, and the techniques that we use uh, all are part of this tradition. So uh, a very kind of significant way of seeing that this, this tradition is ongoing and that you actually have a part in it as well. So this brings us back to uh, your backyard, my backyard, uh, and our, our collective backyards in the parks and areas around us. Uh, and back to this question of what is a naturalist? And, and here's a, a shout out to Tim Vargo, because I know he's going to be watching this later. And I, I told him, you know, he'd have to watch closely to see if he recognized someone in particular. So what do you think? Is this going to be sufficient? You think he'll recognize it? Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here and, and just uh, open up to a couple of questions uh, or see what else has come to mind. Uh, more reflections on Coles, more reflections on your own individual trajectories to becoming a naturalist or other ways that you think uh, should be or could be opened up for naturalists in the future. Any comments along those lines? Testimonials?
the drugs the outdoors is a mad choice. All right. I do see the question from Lila about Puget Sound um, these days. How is Puget Sound? Uh, the big news out of Puget Sound is always about the salmon populations, uh, both because it's important to the fisheries, uh, but also because uh, it's an indicator of the health of the waters and, and how, the, how the different uh, shipping channels and the currents and the uh, food supplies might be affecting them. Interesting connection there is Victor Shelford uh, actually helped to found the Puget Sound. It was called the, the Puget Sound Research Station. Now it's Friday Harbor Laboratories um, and spent quite a bit of time doing research himself in Puget Sound. Uh, and Coles also visited there. I have pictures from Coles's trips out west where he was in some of the very same places, actually the same place I showed you that picture with my daughter and, and friend from high school. Coles visited that same bay back in the, the 1920s. You know, one of the interesting things, I took an ecology class, not to date myself, 47 years ago. <laughs> and uh, what was so interesting there, and a behavior class, that's what I was involved in. And it was so interesting, the schism between like Nico Tinbergen and Conrad Lorenz who are out in the field and then this very mechanistic lab approach that others were doing in the States. Yes. And so it's kind of fun now to see people in the United States going back and valuing nature and the outdoors. Thank you. That's a really important comment. And that was, that was a schism. That was a kind of something that, that naturalists in the United States were struggling with even at the time. People like Shelford during that period were making constant calls to, you know, for scientists to continue their naturalist training, to not just abandon um, the, the time in nature. Uh, and I saw that in the work that he did with his students, like Rasmussen, who I mentioned, to go out to places where they were familiar, where they had some expertise, and to continue their research and writing about that. Um, Shelford actually published a book in 1926 uh, called A Naturalist Guide to the Americas. And oh, the point cool. of that book was actually to show all of the places that had been preserved up to that point where scientists needed to go out and study and to continue to be engaged in you know new research uh, out in those areas and and the other twist on that is of course he wanted to preserve those places because those were the only places left worth studying well of course uh, they're still worth studying but we've got places like our own backyards that are still worth studying Thanks, Robin. Other reflections on the naturalist tradition here? I think for a lot of people, scouting was their first experience with the, with, with the outdoors, especially if you're from an urban environment. Right. And, um, that really varied depending on the troop leader. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I know my wife worked for Girl Scouts for many, many years and taking um, inner city kids to overnight out in the country was a very scary thing for them. It was um, scarier than living in uh, the inner city where mm -hmm. crime around them. Right. Uh, I mean, there are animals out there. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Really important point. The scouting tradition is something I haven't really included here, but it's, it's certainly worth mentioning. I'm glad you brought it up and it was available to boys and at a different time and in some different ways available to girls. And so the continuation of that uh, is really important. I think as, as partnerships in these areas continue. Uh, yeah, let me go I'd... back to oh, go just a, a final um, slide here, just to say that, um, you know, in your own backyards, and you all know this, that you can make observations different times of the day and through different seasons. Um, and for those who might not be familiar with the idea of phenology studies, um, having a phenology of your own backyard, taking pictures uh, at different times of the year, uh, recording temperature and rainfall, 
uh, and seeing what comes into bloom at different times is work that uh, Aldo Leopold did uh, and is work that naturalists have done for, for generations and that we each can continue that. Uh, Mark Heinlein has written a wonderful book called Ground Truth where he encourages people to do that uh, in their own backyards. He calls it their side yards, uh, a New England term. But the value of that for all of us is really enormous, we, especially as we share that. Uh, I know we were talking beforehand about some of the tools that are available. Um, and last week, the Yardversity event uh, in people's backyards highlighted some of this, uh, not just a phenology approach, but kind of a, a blitz approach to, to capturing everything you can, you can in a single morning or a single day uh, using binoculars or magnifying glasses or cameras. Uh, and, and some of you have been describing with a lot of enthusiasm some of the new digital identification uh, apps that are available on your phone. Uh, not to forget about field guides, which are wonderful ways to browse through and understand the connections uh, between some of, the, some of the organisms in your backyard. And then as with the naturalist tradition throughout its history, uh, we rely on networks of experts and of other naturalists who can help us to understand and refine our knowledge of the world around us. Uh, and so keeping connected with organizations that can help us do that is really important. The Urban Ecology Center, if you're in Milwaukee, uh, is just, you know, such a wonderful resource and, and so uh, has been so good at making these kinds of opportunities available, even uh, in the last months when we've been kind of staying away from each other, but hopefully not staying away from nature. Um, really great opportunities. So I want to thank you for uh, joining along here. We can have a little more conversation as we go, but I think I'll kind of wrap it up here. This is a photo of me uh, in my hometown standing next to a sign, uh, and it says, who was Raleigh Johnson? And He's a, a, a name, that's a name that could be on the list of naturalists that would have a lot of resonance for me uh, and maybe people who grew up in Hutchinson, Minnesota. Uh, Raleigh Johnson was a naturalist who was a teacher in the high school for many decades and who uh, inspired us and took us out in the field uh, and helped us with the, the tools of identification uh, and I think really kept this tradition alive for me. And so I'm, I'm proud uh, now and, and very privileged to be able to continue that tradition with students and with my own family and friends. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to stick around here if you have other questions but I just appreciate your time and your attention. And I, I really hope that you've found this uh, valuable and interesting.